Good afternoon, I'm Cindy Hall, president of the Women's Congressional Policy Institute, WCPI. Welcome to Invent Together and WCPI's virtual congressional briefing, Women in Patents, Increasing Diversity in the Innovation Ecosystem. During today's discussion, we will hear from patent experts about the latest data regarding the gender patent gap in the United States, personal stories from women inventors, and what can be done to ensure that more women innovators take advantage of our nation's patent system. We are pleased to co-sponsor today's event with Invent Together, a coalition of organizations, universities, companies, and other stakeholders dedicated to understanding the diversity gaps in invention and patenting and supporting public policy and private initiatives to close them. As most of you know, WCPI is a nonpartisan nonprofit public policy organization whose mission is to bring together a community of bipartisan women policymakers and trusted partners to advance issues of importance to women, develop the next generation of women leaders, and foster a more effective and representative democracy. We work closely with the members and staff of the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues. I would like to thank our congressional briefing co-sponsors, the leadership of the Women's Caucus, Congresswomen Madeline Dean and Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, co-chairs who you will hear from in just a minute, and Congresswomen Lucy McBath and Kat Kamak, vice chairs. Our special thanks to Qualcomm for their support for this briefing. We appreciate their commitment to promoting gender equity and technology and increasing the number of women in STEAM related fields. Our special thanks to our moderator, Holly Fechner, and our speakers, Elise Shaw, Valencia Martin Wallace, and Dr. Lola Awomiyi Oteri, each of whom will be introduced shortly. We welcome WCPI board members, Mary Lacey Ruther and Julia Felice Sessoms. We also welcome Congresswoman Lois Frankel, who is attending today's briefing. I am now pleased to introduce Congresswoman Madeline Dean, Democratic Co-Chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues. Congresswoman Dean is serving her second term representing the 4th District of Pennsylvania, and she serves on the Financial Services and Judiciary Committees. Congresswoman Dean is a champion for women and girls' education, including women in STEAM. Congresswoman? Well, Cindy, you know, it is always a pleasure to be with you and the Women's Congressional Policy Institute. So thanks for inviting us again and always partnering with us so that your work is stronger and our work is stronger. Uh, thank you to our moderator, Holly Fletcher, the panelists, Elise Shaw, Valencia Martin-Wallace, Dr. Lola Awaniyi Oteri, and Congresswoman, my colleague, my uh, co-chair, Congresswoman Jennifer gonzalez Colon. It's a delight to be with you, especially to talk about these issues. You know, the Bipartisan Women's Caucus has made it a priority to focus on the pol policies that lift uh, women and girls in STEAM. And we are thankful to partner with WCPI on these briefings. As a caucus, we recently hosted a briefing alongside NASA, which was so exciting to discuss the role of women in the Artemis program. As we saw with the women of Artemis, women have an impact to make in this world. And we must give them the tools to harness that courage and their intellects to succeed. Long-held stereotypes have discouraged uh, and pushed young girls and women away from steam fields. We need to continue to disprove stereotypes in the real world, to build a better world where everyone feels encouraged to study science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So as, we, uh, as early as we can, uh, we must all excite young girls, and I'm thinking of my own granddaughters in this, uh, around STEAM. Studies have shown that children who lack access to quality STEAM educational financial stability and exposure to innovation during their childhood are much less likely to become inventors. We cannot allow lazy stereotypes or inadequate funding to prevent us from producing the next uh, Marie Curie, Alice Parker, or Katherine Johnson. In 2018, researchers at Yale University found after examining almost 3 million US patent application, applications 
that women's patent applications are more likely to be rejected than those of men. And those rejections are less likely to be appealed. That's stunning uh, data. Maybe it's not surprising, uh, but it's data we need to pay attention to. While the gender gap faced by women inventors is decreasing gradually, at the current rate, it will take more than 100 years to reach gender parity in the US patent process. We can't allow that to happen. Ad addressing gender and racial inequalities uh, in the United States patent system is not just a matter of fairness for women who are black, brown, Latino, uh, or people of any color, utilizing the full potential of all inventors, regardless of their gender or race, can generate economic growth for both uh, unrepresented inventors and for our entire nation. To, to ensure that the United States remains a leader in innovation, uh, we must ensure that we have a broad ecosystem, demographically, geographically, economically. And we must start young and show young girls and women the potential they have in innovation. It makes me all the more thankful for this conversation today. I'm delighted to be a part of it. Always thankful, Cindy, that you include me. Uh, and I look forward to the next generation conversation. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Dean. <laughs> yes, agreed with Congresswoman Gonzalez Colon for your remarks, always thoughtful, always on point, um, and your commitment to expanding opportunities for women and girls. As you point out, both, we need to start young in STEAM. Thank you so much. And now I'm very pleased to introduce Congresswoman Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, Republican co-chair of the Women's Caucus. Congresswoman Gonzalez Colon was elected to represent Puerto Rico in 2016 and serves on the Natural Resources and Transportation and Infrastructure Committees. And her priorities also include promoting STEAM education in Puerto Rico and supporting funding for research and STEAM related programs. Thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Cindy. I'm happy and thrilled to be in this panel and, and having this remarkable group of ladies uh, that are the leaders on their field. And I think this is the first time we're having a briefing like this. So. I, I truly understand this can make a change and uh, I'm happy to see my friend Marilyn Dean here. As always, uh, we are a team. And, and I think this, this is the way uh, all women uh, should work as, as a team. Um, and, and having said that, I think it's, it's important uh, for everybody joining us uh, today to discuss uh, important issues like this that are not usually making headlines. Um, the lack of women representation in, in the patent process should, should sound a little bit awkward, uh, but it's basically, uh, you know, everything regarding uh, our way of life. I, and, I, and I need to say that although the Patent Act of uh, 1790 allowed both men and women to protect their inventions, several states uh, did not allow women uh, to own property at the time. Therefore, patents for invention by women uh, were regularly e issued under their husband's names. Uh, thus, the first US patent uh, issued to a woman inventor, Hannah Wilkinson Slater, in 1793 uh, for a new method of producing cotton sewage thread was issued to Miss, uh, Mrs. Uh, Samuel Slater. Um, I, I think it was not until 1889 uh, that uh, the United States issued a patent to a woman inventor in her own name uh, when Mary Kies, uh, Kies became the first woman to legally own uh, the property of her design, a technique women straw with silk. Um, in three decades after Mary Kies obtained her patent, only 19 other women uh, were issued uh, patents. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, of the 680,000 patents issued in the United States in the first years uh, after the Patent Act was enacted, uh, women only accounted for 0.6% of the inventors of record. Um, and studies show that by 1980s, um, the numbers of new women entrants into the patent system was about only 5%. And, and, and in 2019, that number increased and doubled uh, to 17%. Uh, moreover, in 1980s, 28% uh, of, of women with at least one patent applied for another one in, in, in within five years. Um, and as 2019, this number increased to 46%, which is the double. 
Uh, I think women are responsible for groundbreaking and vital inventions uh, such as life rafts, uh, fire escapes, Kevlar, um, the medical syringe, uh, computer algorithm, algorithm um, dishwasher, uh, the Glove alphabet uh, blocks. Um, I'm a favorite of the Monopoly game, so I need to say that. Um, the electric uh, refrigerator, uh, thermoelectric power generator, uh, the disposable diaper, uh, caller ID and call waiting, uh, the home security system, um, uh, the circular, circular saw, laser cataract uh, surgery, uh, car heater, and even uh, windshield wipers. Uh, how, and, and I can be with a longer list than this, but I think, however, uh, globally, uh, women made only 13 of all patent owners as 2019 and at the current rate gender patent equality is more than 75 years away and having said that and hearing what madeline said i, I think it's true that uh, why has the gender gap in the issuance of patents remained uh, so unbalanced across this this its centuries of existence and those studies that madeline was was showing have found that although there appears to be a gender bias in both applications and in the considerations of those applications the main reason for this gap uh, is the underrepresentation of women students uh, in most of the patents intensive fields uh, which directly uh, translates uh, to a lower female representation in those workforces um, and i think we must do better uh, and encouraging young girls to become involved in STEAM fields and to support women uh, who have entered these fields. And that's the reason this, this panel is so important for me because I truly believe at first, this is the first time I hear we, we're dealing with the patents in terms of the gender. Uh, second, we get a, a remarkable uh, group of leaders in the field that are going to be speaking today. And I look forward to listening uh, to the panel suggestions on as how uh, we can get this done, how we in Congress can encourage this in, in, as, as women support each other. So thank you, Cindy, for co coordinating this and, and to the all, all leaders that are in the panel. Thank you so much, Congresswoman gonzalez Clone. It's obvious that both the co-chairs have an intense interest in this and have really made this issue, the broad issue of women and girls in STEAM, but then obviously quite interested in this issue too, uh, such a priority. Um, so we are thrilled to bring more attention to this issue, and I'm very happy now to introduce our moderator, Holly Fechner, who's a partner at Covington and Burling and executive director of Invent Together. As executive director of Invent Together, Holly supports efforts to increase the availability of data and research on patent gaps in order to break down race, gender, and other barriers to ensure that the United States remains a global leader in innovation. At Covington and Burling, Holly advises clients on complex public policy and regulatory matters and co-chairs Covington's technology industry group. Prior to her current roles, Holly served as policy director for the late Senator Edward Kennedy and chief labor and pensions counsel for the Senate Health Education Labor and Pensions Committee. Holly? Well, thank you so much, uh, Cindy, and what a pleasure it is to be here. And I'm so grateful for those remarks from the co-chairs. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, Congresswomen Dean and Gonzalez Colon really get this issue. So we appreciate uh, their leadership on STEAM and we look forward to working with them closely um, on increasing uh, the number of women who invent and patent. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, the Congressional, uh, the Women's Congressional Policy Institute, and particularly uh, Cindy Hall for her decades of leadership on women's issues. As Cindy said, my name is Holly Peckner, and I'm the executive director of Invent Together. Invent Together is an initiative to bring together stakeholders dedicated to understanding the gender, race, and other diversity gaps in inventing and patenting, and to work with policymakers on solutions to close them, and also to work with the private sector because the private sector has an important role to play here as well. As we will talk about, inventing and patenting play a critical role in our economy. 
Inventors who hold patents benefit from higher incomes, new job and promotion opportunities, broader social networks and heightened prestige. And businesses that hold patents enjoy higher revenue and higher rates of job creation. Invent Together believes that everyone should have the opportunity to invent and patent. However, the United States Patent and Trademark Office and leading researchers uh, like Alicia, who's with us here today, have found large and disturbing patent gaps. So I just want to set the table by letting you know what we do know about these patent gaps. Uh, as the Congresswoman said, less than 13% of all inventors who hold US patents are women. That's a figure from 2019. And women hold only 5.5% of all commercialized patents, which are the patents that can be licensed and uh, add to our economy. Um, Black and Latino college graduates apply for and obtain patents at half the rate of their white counterparts. Uh, and patent activity by Black inventors peaked in 1899 as, and, not, and has not recovered since then. And I find this last statistics uh, astounding. Um, and this is from researchers at Harvard University. Children and families in the top 1% of income are 10 times more likely to patent as adults than children and families in the entire bottom half of family income. So we know we have to do better. Closing these gaps would offer meaningful benefits to individuals, families, and our country as a whole. In fact, uh, increasing the number of women and uh, people of color who patent would increase the gross domestic product by almost a trillion dollars. This is uh, from research by another leading academic in the field, Dr. Lisa Cook from Michigan State University. And what's more, uh, more diverse inventors will lead to new, exciting, and different inventions. And I think the Congresswoman gave us a sense of that by uh, her list of all the inventions uh, by women. Just, just imagine uh, if, if we didn't have uh, some of those inventions in our lives. So over the past number of years, Invent Together has worked with inventors, academics, organizations, and industry representatives to support research in this field, to convene roundtable discussions, to strategize with our partners about these issues, um, and to champion the Success Act, which was a bill that Congress passed in 2019, which required the US Patent and Trademark Office to study and report on the available data on the number of patents applied for and obtained by women, racial and ethnic minorities, and veterans. And I hope we'll hear more about that from one of our speakers later today. Um, and the bill also uh, asked the USPTO to make recommendations for how to diversify inventing and patenting and related entrepreneurial activity. We encourage you to learn more about our work and you can find us at our website at inventtogether.org. Um, and please also follow us on Twitter at Invent Together. Today's briefing features three accomplished leaders in this field with unique and important insights on patent diversity. First, we'll hear from Ali Shaw, the primary author of a report on the experiences of women inventors. We'll then be joined by the rest of the panel for a moderated discussion. So let me introduce Elise. Uh, she is the study director for the Institute for Women's Policy Research. And in addition to her work on women in innovation, Elise directs IWPR's projects on the status of women in the United States, women's political participation, as well as projects examining the intersectional nature of race and gender on the lives of girls and women. Welcome, Elise. We're excited to hear more about IWPR's important research. 
Thank you so much, Holly, and really thank you to everyone here for inviting me to speak on this really important topic. It's one that I know we at IWPR are very passionate about, um, and I'm really glad to see it getting more and more coverage, more and more attention, um, as the con both Congresswomen have pointed out, as well as Holly, you know, innovation is the hallmark of American culture. And yet women and people of color are woefully underrepresented as inventors. You know, we're facing some pressing challenges in our world today, you know, pandemics, climate change, food insecurity, and we really need a greater diversity of perspectives in order to find the solutions to these pressing problems. Um, I truly believe that the solutions are out there and someone has thought of them. We just need to connect them to the resources they need to scale it up and bring it to our, our, our global society. So IDPR has been working very closely with Invent Together over the years, doing research. You guys have covered a lot of our prior research already, so I won't dive into that too much. Um, but just to kind of give you a brief view of also why this is so important, when you look at entrepreneurship, which is another hallmark of, you know, American culture, you know, intellectual property really matters when it comes to getting your, organ your company off the ground. Um, when we look at IP among women, female entrepreneurs, we see that it really impacts how their businesses do. So, women-owned businesses are less likely than their male-owned counterparts to have IP rights. Um, and yet, women-owned businesses that have at least a patent pending have revenues that are more than 16, 16 times higher than women-owned businesses without intellectual property or a patent pending. It's really stark to see the impact it can have on making sure that our businesses succeed, that women-owned businesses succeed. Um, and, and IP holdings help attract startup capital. If you look at the breakdown of who gets, you know, the, the lion's share of startup capital, um, male, men-owned businesses are twice as likely to have a million or more in startup capital than women-owned businesses. So it really makes a difference. Um, like Holly said, it makes a difference to our economy. It makes a difference on an individual level and it really getting these solutions out there. There are programs out there that are helping address this issue. Um, I think more research needs to be done. We've done a small research project looking at, you know, what programs are out there and what makes them successful and getting more women into patenting and entrepreneurship. Um, and, you know, I would encourage you to go check out all of our research at IWPR.org. Today, I'm going to focus, as Holly said, on our upcoming research and upcoming reports. So you're getting a little sneak peek at some research that I've conducted over the past nine months. Um, we really wanted to dig down on the whys. There's a lot of data out there on, you know, the share of patent holders, we, we kind of know some of the figures and some of the numbers, how long women will have to wait for parity, but what is going on from idea to successfully obtaining a patent? What are the barriers? What are the hangups? So we, look, we start, started looking into this just a little bit. Um, we really aim to discover what are the challenges and systemic barriers and what are the crucial supports that help women get through? We conducted 21 in-depth interviews with patent holders, um, 16 women, 11 whom are women of color, and five men, just to kind of give us a little understanding of where are the differences and where are the similarities between women and men. And this is just a brief, you know, start of tip of the iceberg. I think so much more needs to be uncovered from our research here. But when we looked at the stories, when we looked at these women's experiences, and these are successful women who have patented, some of them are prolific inventors, hold 30 to 60 patents. All of them have faced challenges when it comes to getting their in innovations and inventions patented. A lot of these were systemic barriers. Every woman interviewed shared multiple stories of facing stereotypes, discrimination, and bias throughout their careers, throughout the patenting process. It impacted them. They had stories of friends <laughs> having really hangups uh, along the way that they had to really work hard to overcome. Some even experienced sexual harassment from peers, colleagues, and even investors. So we had a few entrepreneurs who talked about investors who would make comments and really off-putting remarks 
um, when they were trying to get funding for their startup. We, we really focused in on a lot of the women of color in the STEM fields, you know, they faced additional race gender biases, which can be quite difficult to overcome, especially in the workplace. A lot of these women talked about the biases they experienced throughout the process. Um, I'm just gonna, you know, go over some of the major themes, but all of this is detailed with many stories in our upcoming report, it comes out next Tuesday. A lot of the women talked about their experiences being the only in the room. So the only woman or the only woman of color. And the women who are the only are more likely to have negative experiences. They are more likely to have their abilities challenged or feel like they're standing in for all women. So they have to be that much better, that much more polished, that much more accomplished. And most of the women and some of the men we interviewed attributed some of the lack of diversity in patenting to the lack of women and women of color in, in STEAM fields, as we've heard. So getting, you know, really fixing this pipeline issue, getting younger adolescent women, you know, young girls into this process, getting them exposed to innovation, getting them involved in these, in these careers early is very, very crucial. However, we do know that there is data out there that women uh, and women of color are graduating with STEM degrees at higher and higher rates. So we're seeing this attrition. So hopefully that will trickle up. However, there are other systemic issues that we must tackle. A lot of the women talked about, you know, workplace barriers, including facing, you know, motherhood penalties if they were to have children, work-life balance issues, as well as a lot of people talked about how women were transitioned off of research career paths oftentimes in the case they might have they might have children you know they were discouraged from going into the research career paths into the highly patent intensive career fields because they might want to have children one day so we really need to tackle a lot of these systemic issues to fix that pipeline problem so women that are necessarily graduating with these degrees aren't always ending up where they will be in fields where they can patent Another big issue that was really talked about by all the inventors was the lack of formal education on the patenting system and process. Um, the patenting system and process can be quite complex. There were a lot of misunderstandings for a lot of women and because there's no formal education, you have to rely on informal, informal word of mouth mentors, networks to really support you and to tell you how this process works. Most of the women said when they first started um, out, they didn't understand even what constituted an invention that could be patent. A number of women spoke about they did not know where to find resources on how to patent. One woman said she only found out about patenting because her, her invention that she came up with with another person was patented without her. And she was like, what is patenting and how do I do this? <laughs> you know, there's so many things that people just don't have a basic understanding of. And this really impacts women throughout their patenting careers. Um, a lack of understanding really just highlights the importance of mentors and networks. One of the issues that actually came up that the Congresswoman talked about is rejections and appeals. A lot of the women spoke about misunderstanding that a rejection is oftentimes an invitation to refine and resubmit. They don't appeal the rejection. They don't know that that's it. They think a rejection is a rejection and they're done. And then they go through either a accelerator program or they learn from a mentor that no, 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 oftentimes you have to refine a few things and you can resubmit and you're fine and you'll, you'll eventually get your acceptance. But of so many of the women said they did not understand this when they first started out. So this means informal education and mentoring is essential to women's success. Yet um, most of the women we talked to, 14 of the 16 women said they had to work harder to find resources, mentors, and networks to help them through this process. They felt like they had to struggle more than their male colleagues. It wasn't just kind of laid out for them what they should do. And we also found that the gatekeepers to the patenting process matters. You know, having someone in the room as a young inventor, you're often patenting as a part of a team and you're not always in the room when it's decided who's going to be on that patent. So supervisors and advisors, especially academic advisors are crucial to advocating on behalf of young patent holders, um, young inventors who are looking for their first patent. Another gatekeeper are patent attorneys. A lot of people talked about the disconnect that can sometimes happen between the legalese that needs to go into a patent application and the technical 
aspects of their invention? And how do we kind of get over that so there's not so much back and forth, time, money, and energy spent on these issues? And then technology transfer offers specific offices in specific in universities. Those were the other gatekeepers that can really help either support you or can be kind of a barrier for some women. Some women felt that, you know, if you didn't have a track record of successfully, you know, having a patent that, you know, brought in revenue, the tech, tech transfer offices were less likely to help you along as quickly as they were for established academics, which tend to be older white men. So this, our research goes into a whole host. I would, I really would recommend you look for it next Tuesday. There's so many more details. I know we have a whole discussion on a lot of these issues coming up. Um, we talked a lot, you know, in our research, we talk a lot about the different settings, either academic, corporate, or entrepreneurship that have unique barriers as well. Money being one of them for entrepreneurs. So I would love to dig more into this um, and we'll talk more about this on the panel, but just, just a little sneak peek of our research in our upcoming report. Thank you so much, Elise. And I think it's just super clear how much we can learn by talking to women, talking to women and learning about their experiences. And I think you've, you've pulled apart so many of the, the specific barriers that happen in, different times, different places, um, which I think helps lead us to thinking about the, the solutions, both the, from a public policy perspective, but also from a private sector perspective. Well, next, I'd love to, to bring in our other panelists to join us in this discussion. Uh, so let me uh, reintroduce them. Uh, Valencia Martin Wallace is the Deputy Commissioner for Patents at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and she is also the Executive Lead for the USPTO's National Council for Expanding American Innovation. And I'm sure Valencia is going to tell us more about the NCEAI. Uh, Dr. Lola Awania Oteri is a Principal Engineer at Qualcomm with more than 150 approved patents. I'm just exhausted even saying that, um, knowing what, what must have gone into that. Uh, Lola focuses her work on the research and development of 5G wireless technologies, uh, including millimeter wave. Um, she received her bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Georgia Tech and her master's and PhD degrees also in electrical engineering from Stanford University. So welcome to you both today. Valencia, let me start with you. Um, so at, we are grateful to Congress for passing the Success Act uh, and starting a process at the USPTO to look more closely at this issue. And one of the terrific things that came out of all the work over at the PTO is the um, National Council. So please tell us more about that uh, and what, what your plans are for the council. Thanks, Holly. So great to be here. Thank you so much for having me and being with this dynamic group of women. Uh, first, you know what, I'm gonna take a second to say thank you very much to Holly because uh, as I'm talking about the NCAI, the council is as well as the strategy, she has been pivotal to assisting uh, the USPTO in, in helping us to develop a strong council as well as in assisting us in the development of the strategy. So thank you so much, Holly, for all the work that you do. So yes, I am I'm thrilled to talk about the uh, NCAI. So just a little bit more background, because Holly already mentioned that the Success Act um, mandated the USPTO to look into uh, underrepresented uh, groups in the IP system, especially as inventors and patent owners. The report the USPTO put out had several recommendations to Congress, as well as some initiatives that we would start ourselves, one being developing this council. And this council's specific focus uh, is women, and underrepresented, other underrepresented groups in the STEM fields and the IP community, and how to correct that. So our council's main objective is developing the strategy on innovation and intellectual property 
and a plan of action to foster in the, the environment of under the involvement, I'm sorry, of underrepresented groups as inventors, patentees, entrepreneurs, innovators, and doing this by developing and executing this long-term, long-term comprehensive plan for continuing to build America's innovation ecosystem. So the council is made up of representatives from industry, uh, we have CEO C-suite members from uh, our, from the industry industry around the United States, from nonprofit organizations, academia. We have presidents from universities, and we have uh, other government departments and agencies. And I want to share that to just think about that group that we have. We need every single part of that, because just as what we're doing here, you know, we have to have diversity of opinion, diversity of background to come to the right conclusions on how to move forward. And it's been mentioned many times here already, there are a great deal of phenomenal programs that are out there. How are we collaborating to make sure that we are having the impact that we want? It's by coming together. It's by this council coming together. It's about these types of events that are bringing not only light on the problem, but bringing solutions and bringing those solutions together. And that's what the strategy is about. So the council got together last year to uh, to help us put together our concept paper as to the direction of the strategy. And we have been feverishly working uh, with the council and with work group representatives from across all of these fields to help the USPTO put this strategy together. Now, the strategy, while we are still working on it and we are hoping to have the strategy completed and, and uh, published this year, we've taken uh, an approach with the strategy that begins with the youngest of our potential inventors, three and four years old. How do you give them the access, the education, the nurturing at the youngest age, not only on the amazing fields of STEAM, but also on how from there do you actually invent? And from there, how do you develop that invention into a new business, into something that is going to not only assist in financially with the individual and support the individual, but support this nation? You know, when people ask me, why should we do this? My number one basic reason is because it's the right thing to do. You cannot get around that. It's the right thing to do. But you know what? If you want to look more to the business sense, as already has been mentioned here, it's because it's going to support our nation. It's going to take our nation into the future, keep us as leaders in the uh, in the next technology. It's going to really help support and move forward. And that's what our strategy is doing, starting with the education of the youngest among us and building at every stage of an innovator and inventor's life, building on that education, building on the access that we're giving to the programs, to the funds, to assistance and commercialization in order to further develop and become inventors, patent owners, entrepreneurs. So the next stage from the creating an inventor in education is also then practicing the uh, practicing innovation and some of what we've already discussed here with which essentially is taking out or making aware of unconscious biases within universities, within the government, within corporations, addressing it and resolving it, giving equal access making it just as equitable for a mother who comes back from having her child and back into the research and then invention and patent owners as any of her counterparts that has still been there. It's making sure that the equality and equity for everyone. And then we go to realizing the in innovation, which is once you have an inventor has invented, how do you then commercialize? How do you make successful that invention? And so our strategy is giving actions along that in entire path, not just 
assisting the inventor, the innovator on how to access these things, but assisting and telling the corporate world, academia, government, all sectors of our IP and innovation community, how do you support, educate, and give access to all Americans? There should not be a single, and it's the saddest thing, and I know it's been said already, saddest thing when you hear someone doesn't know a patent, and it doesn't have to be a child, what that means. Not, not just how to get it, but what is a patent? What is protecting your intellectual property when they don't understand? So we should not have a single person in this country who does not understand that. And I will just, I'll just mention one more thing. Part of our strategy is next is measuring success. You can't just put in place these programs and initiatives. You have to actually measure. And that has been a very challenging across our entire innovation ecosystem is making sure that we have the proper amount of data. And I know Elise knows what I'm talking about here as you're doing your research, having the proper amount of data, sharing that data at each sect of our community and measuring our successes, what's working, what's not, and how do we grow into the future? So that's, I'm going to stop there because I could just go on forever about this. And I want to hear from all of these uh, dynamic women here. But that's where we are. And as I mentioned, we're hoping to have the strategy uh, out this year. Well, that is really exciting, Valencia. And I, I think it's so important how you've broken it down into those uh, three different areas, creating mm -hmm. inventors, practicing uh, invention, and realizing invention, and then the fourth uh, prong about measuring it. It it's, uh, seems like a very sound strategy and we we really look forward to it. Um, and, and speaking of inventors who are helping the US lead in innovative technologies, uh, let's let's talk with you, Lola. Um, I, I, I would love, and I know our audience would love to hear more about your work on 5G and millimeter wave. Yes, uh, thank you, Holly. Uh, so I have uh, been working on 5G since uh, the inception. And what I do in 5G, I'm actually working on a version of 5G called the millimeter wave uh, version. And that's the version where we have this large, huge bandwidth uh, to carry a lot of traffic and um, huge band, um, applications that actually demand a huge bandwidth. For example, we're seeing uh, extended reality, virtual reality, and, and augmented reality coming into light. And this is this are the type of traffic we're carrying over millimeter wave. So when we are using this uh, kind of applications, they are used for, for example, training, they are used for helping patients during re rehabilitation uh, process. Uh, this type of application actually very useful. And 5G of itself actually has come uh, not to just be a technology for, for what we do on the cell phone. You can see it actually revolutionizing a lot of verticals, like you know, the healthcare, manufacturing, smart cities. So those are the kind of technologies that I am working on. And specifically, I'm looking at the impact on how we can help with power saving. So we want to be able to transmit our data over the network, but also we want our devices not to drain too much power. We don't want to be charging, have to be charging our phones every single day or watch smart watch every single day. So how do we do this effectively in ways where we actually don't drain too much power? And also when you are moving in your car or with your device and you go from one location to another, how do we make sure that we efficiently uh, transfer your calls or your, or your transmission in ways where we actually maintain good user experience. So that, those are some of the things I am working on in 5G and also looking forward to 6G too. As, as, we, as we work on 5G, we're starting to think about what will happen in the next generation. <laughs> that is really exciting. Um, I wanted to ask you, Elise talked about the experiences of other women inventors and um, she did mention particularly um, some of the barriers that women of color faced as they become inventors. Did any of those resonate with you in your own experience? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think a number of them uh, does uh, resonate with me, especially the one about uh, being the only woman, uh, a will, only woman most of the time and only woman of color uh, most of the time in the room. Um, this has been the case from grad school up until even working in corporate America and in my, even um, in my career as an inventor, most times I am only, the only woman of color in the room. And another one that resonates with me actually is the issue of um, bias, like you know, unconscious bias or stereotypes. 
And uh, one, one particular uh, scenario that comes to mind, um, I've had the opportunity of working with hundreds of, invent, uh, of patent attorneys in my career. Uh, but I remember specifically one, uh, one where I was working with a patent attorney and my idea, he was just meant to help me file this patent uh, with the USPTO's office. And the, uh, the attorney taught my, that my idea did not have uh, novelty, like he could not see the novelty in the idea and he didn't think it was new. Uh, bear with me though, this is an idea that has passed through the, the huddles of uh, experts within the company, uh, within the patent review board, people who have been in industry for over 30 years have vetted this idea and they thought it was new. Uh, so this uh, patent attorney went ahead and drafted claims that were totally different from what I wanted, right? <laughs> But so I had to go back and forth, bring in uh, references and sources and, and trying to convince that, you know, this is actually not the idea that I want to cover and this is exactly what it was. Eventually we went through this back and forth and, and it, um, the claims ended up reflecting the idea that I wanted to put forth. Uh, but to, to me, it was just the sheer effort that it actually took to convince uh, somebody to just help me file, you know, the idea. And um, I, I would like to say that um, this doesn't happen too often, but. I run into those um, quite often in, in my career. So those are some of the things that resonated with me, I think from uh, this is the, yeah. Thanks so much, Lola. We really appreciate you sharing your experiences. And, and Valencia, I did want to pick up on something that Lola said related to her experience with a particular patent attorney, because um, I think we've seen from the research that um, Elise has done that it really does matter. It matters that, that people have access to attorneys and other mentors, other people who can support them um, in their work. And one thing that, that we um, have seen is, I think the, the estimate is that only about 18 to 22% of the patent bar um, is made up of women. Um, and then less than 6% are people of color and less than 2% are women of color. Um, and and I, I'm just curious about whether the USPTO is looking at this issue and, and what you think about this. Great question. Thank you, Holly. So yes, we are looking at it. It actually started a few years back when we had a congressional request from uh, Senator Serrano, Tillis and Coons to look at uh, the gender gap in our uh, patent practitioners, which we found the those numbers, dismal numbers of the number of women who are uh, practicing through the office. And we have three categories that you can qualify under uh, to, to uh, practice through the office. One category being that you have a specified bachelor's degree. In that particular uh, group, 32.5% have identified uh, under MISS, so we took as female. We have a, a second category where there's bachelor's degrees with related technical and scientific training in them, and we saw 41%. Now, with our category C, which is practical engineering and scientific experience, we have a dismal 7% that mm. uh, were identified as female. So, yes, based on that information, based on looking into it, the office put out a request for comment on three proposals to help combat the uh, lack of inclusion of women and people of color in uh, as practitioners, meaning agents or attorneys. So the first proposal that was put out was to uh, identify those degrees with those uh, trainings in science and engineering, that's part of that, that second category, making that part of the first category. Those degrees simply are what will be identified and will help you um, in, in uh, becoming a practitioner through the office. You know, we also uh, put out a, a second proposal. Uh, the proposal required that, that uh, that second category, um, that there be an, uh, an acceptance of a combination of core sciences that aren't necessarily uh, accepted at this point as also a qualifier for being part of uh, the patent bar. And we also uh, provided that a third proposal that we put out that, uh, I'm sorry, that was the third pro proposal that 
that you have those sciences as well as a lab. So mm -hmm. we got comments on that. We have about 32 comments that actually we've already considered, or, or I'm sorry, already uh, published out the comments that came through the RFC. We are now going to use those comments to, um, to tweak, fix, and make sure that those proposals are correct. That's going to bring uh, uh, this greater accessibility for, for all underrepresented groups to be part of and work through the patent office. Uh, hopefully that will happen um, this year, but uh, we are a government agency. So we do have to go through our department as well as OMB for review and for approval in order to have that done. But that is what we're looking forward to do to be uh, have a more expansive, more inclusive group. One other thing I want to mention just really quickly is through our PTAB, we have a program, PTAB is a patent trial and appeal board. We have a program called LEAP. That program actually is to assist with um, younger attorneys and agents, those with not much experience, and that's part of the requirement. I think it's uh, only having um, uh, prosecuted through the the trial and appeal board two to three times mm -hmm. and being able to give them training on how to uh, present in front of the board and actually also being able to give them uh, 15 more minutes uh, in order to do their, their, um, their to, to argue their case in front of our patent trial and appeal board to help give what we were talking about earlier as well, education and access, that's key for the further development. So those are two of the things that we're doing right now in order to make uh, our, our practitioners more inclusive. That is wonderful. It's so great to hear the USPTO is looking at uh, basically modernizing those criteria um, so yes. that they, they fit uh, today. Um, Lola, we talked about the obstacles before, but I'd love to hear more about the benefits what does it mean to you to be an inventor and a patent holder? What has it meant in, in your life? Um, thank you for asking that question, Holly. Uh, the benefits, I would say, way um, outweighs uh, the, the, uh, the, the obstacles for me. It definitely, um, it, the benefits make it worthwhile. It makes my career, it validates me on this path that I have chosen to, to walk on. And uh, some of the, the benefits for me, the biggest one for me, I would, I would say is the fulfillment of being able to make a difference. And, and, and just to give you an example, um, I, I've talked about the, the extended reality technology uh, that was that is being used for rehabilitation. So in in some sense, I, um, I, I was talking to a colleague, and the colleague was telling me how they actually used um, this um, virtual reality headset to help a patient who were, who had stroke and was going through their rehabilitation process um, that had gone through physical therapy for months with no improvement. But when they gave the 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 patient actually the the H and D to put on the head and use for rehabilitation within days. They could see improvement. They were moving their limbs and things like that. The day I heard that story, I actually went back home and some of the ideas I was working on, I brushed them off. I was like, okay, I am going to keep on this path. And those kind of stories for me validate um, just the reason why I got into the field to make it and the fact that I can and I am making a difference. Uh, so that's one, one, of the, one of the many benefits for me. Another benefit for me uh, would be that um, the, the ability to even have this knowledge and to be able to, to, to understand a, sp a space and to be able to share my knowledge with other people, to be able to mentor people with my knowledge, to be able to coach with my knowledge. So I've had actually some women, even within Qualcomm, that we worked together. Uh, maybe they were first time uh, patent um, uh, um, pilots who wanted to put their ideas out there. I worked with a lady who actually put out the, um, we worked on an idea, we filed it and then it was approved. And so having all those success stories in, in the ways of even inventing together and working with other women and women of color, I think um, definitely brings a lot of fulfillment uh, to me in my career. And I do have to talk about also the, the monetary benefits. A company like Qualcomm does reward um, its inventors when we have our patents filed and even approved. So there is also that factor. And lastly, I would say even just the creative mindset that you have, it's like a muscle that you grow as you start to create ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, you do get to take this also home to your family and your friends. So you, can, um, I'm sure my, my husband and kids will testify to this, to the fact that I do bug them a lot trying to optimize everything around me. So um, that is another benefit that, that comes with the trade. Yeah, thanks. That, that is quite a host of benefits. 
Um, I want to go through each of our panelists uh, with, with a final question here, looking ahead. So uh, for Elise to focus on policies, for Valencia to focus on uh, best practices that they may have found through their national strategy, and then for Lola to talk about the corporate environment uh, and what corporations can do. So Elise, let's start with you. What are some public policies um, that we could focus on that would improve the situation? I think the, the good news about this topic is there are so many entry points with which to, we can address these issues and make change from, you know, really establishing programs and putting money into programs for early exposure to STEAM for, you know, young girls and young women, um, particularly for young girls and young women of color, you know, it's rolling these programs out through our educational system, as well as, you know, developing and rolling out and establish curricula on patenting and innovation. You know, if we had this in high school, I think that would create so much change amongst, you know, as Valencia said, not even knowing what a patent is, is, you know, just a, a tragedy. We, we need to address this through our educational system. And I think there can be policies and people can really look at, you know, how do we incorporate this into our educational system? Um, you know, we can also tackle workplace issues. So policies that promote work like work life balance and keep more women in the workplace, paid family and medical leave, universal access to affordable and quality childcare. You know, we're seeing, especially in this pandemic world, just how essential those policies are um, to keeping people in, in jobs. You know, having to step back from the workforce would really take a lot of women out of careers where they're, you know, patenting and, and innovating. So, you know, we have all of those, these different buckets. And then, you know, specifically, you know, if you look at governmental programs and grant and grant funding or just funding for, you know, you know, like pro bono legal services, expanding that, investing in that, really making sure that you're putting the full force behind that because people, you know, utilize that quite often. And I, I talked to quite a few women who said, you know, I couldn't get that. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get access to that. I had to pay out of pocket and that was a really hard hit. Um, I had to think about, you know, where I could get this money. And then a lot of people actually spoke about SBIR and STTR funding and how as entrepreneurs, they're only allowed to spend grant money on patent costs in the phase two grants. So they're going through this whole process. They have to cover these costs if they're ready to file these patent applications during phase one grant on their own. They have to figure out their own funds for that. So really looking at these systems and, and, and passing, you know, passing policies that change these to really open up the field and allow, especially you know, women who have a hard time getting investment funds and they're trying to you know, go on entrepreneurial endeavors, you know, funding to go towards patenting costs within that kind of grant would really help them. And data, is there a need for oh more data? <laughs> so yes, thank you, Holly. Um, there's always a need for more data. As a researcher, I always say more data, more data, more data. And most of our data right now, you hear all of these figures that we've thrown at you. These are all based on algorithms that do best guesses mm -hmm. on based on people's names. The USPTO doesn't actually collect the demographic data right now. And we desperately need this. As a researcher, I'm always like, but what's going on for black women? What's going on for Latino women? Like, What is going on for these different groups? And having that data available to researchers would allow us to really understand who is being hit hardest? Where are the, the policies that really need to be targeted and proactive to lift up the groups that are at the lowest level when it comes to patenting and innovation? And we don't have that data right now. So um, always, thank you, Holly. I can't believe I forgot. <laughs> we need more data. We need, we need this demographic data to be collected so that we can really, really hone in our solutions. Thank you. Well, and ladies, I'm sorry, but I think we've just got about 30, minutes, 30 seconds each for Valencia and Lola, but would love your final thoughts. Absolutely. I will go very quickly. I'll just hit my points because I think Elise has already mentioned several of them and, and all during this conversation we have. Training, training on unconscious bias across all sectors, mentoring, mentorings from the youngest all the way through adulthood into innovators, uh, partnership. None of us can do this alone. We have to partner and pool our resources. We're stronger together and transparency. 
collecting of data and sharing of data. And, and I'll go next and I'll just, I, I, in terms of uh, working in a corporate structure and the best practices I've seen, I, Qualcomm is an excellent environment for mentors, uh, for inventors, uh, more because number one, um, the, the plethora of courses given to equip you as an inventor to, in, to invent at Qualcomm is beyond belief. I, I tell people something in grad school that took me hours to read or days and months to understand, um, I walk into the office of an expert in the field and in 20 minutes I'm out the door, I have all the information I, I need to actually go ahead and invent. So creating an environment where we have experts in the field who are willing to mentor the younger ones. When I got into Qualcomm, my first few patents that I walked and I walked on with my VP then who would walk me through the process and tell me what needs to go in the patent and how to, how to actually file, go through the uh, review process and into the filing process. So all of that, if we do have people who are seasoned in the field, especially in uh, with their knowledge and expertise, willing to mentor the younger ones coming uh, in the pipeline and walk them through processes, equip them and then have the cycle. So I I am getting to mentor other people now and just seeing that cycle back again, I think creating that environment is great. And the last thing I also wanted to mention is the fact that most of my patents that I, I have worked on, I worked on in groups. I, I tend to um, collaborate with people a lot. So having this community and, and, and helping to first a community of, of inventors where they can come together and brainstorm together and kind of harness the, that power of a community, I think would be very effective. So th that would be my takeaway. And I would just want to say to the to our policymakers, uh, please help make policies that would make life easier for inventors. I see a lot of women out there who do want to invent, uh, but we are looking for resources and the tools to help us to make things easier for us so we can um, invent to our fullest extent. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much to our panelists and let me send it back to, to Cindy. I really hate ending this. I could listen all afternoon. <laughs> Thank you to Holly, Elise, Valencia, and Lola for such a thought-provoking, fascinating discussion. You covered so many areas. Um, I had no idea this topic had so much to it. Um, and I think um, each of you is inspiring and such a wonderful leader in this area. So thank you for your work. Um, and the expertise and diverse perspectives here today really, I think, were invaluable in improving certainly my understanding and I think the attendees' understanding of how to close the gender patent gap and why it's so important for everyone, not just women, um, to encourage women to participate in the innovation economy and to protect their intellectual property. So we hope today's briefing has raised awareness of this really critical issue. And we help, hope it will help empower women and girls to protect patent rights and pursue patent rights. Um, the conversation was recorded, as we mentioned earlier, um, and should be available for viewing tomorrow morning at our website, wcpinst.org. And in a few minutes, anyone that attended will receive an email inviting you to fill out a brief survey about today's discussion. We really encourage you to do that. Um, it helps us plan future briefings. We also want to hear feedback on what you thought about this topic. We may want to do more on it. Um, I think we will. Um, our thanks also to the Bipartisan Women's Caucus leadership, um, both members and staff. Again, Holly Fechner, her team. Holly, your leadership on this topic and so many others over so, such a long period of time and Qualcomm for their support for this briefing and Lola certainly um, it gave you a great shout out about what a great environment you are for uh, patent holders and inventors. And last but not least, my thanks to Cynthia Ramos, Cheryl Williams, and Julia O'Connor on our team for their work to make this briefing possible. Thank you everyone for joining us. <laughs>